Hello, everybody, and, and welcome to, to this, the, the third and final briefing from the University of Galway, Rhine Institute, and the Master's Programme in Climate Change, Agriculture, and Food Security. This is our briefing on the negotiations at the COP28 uh, Climate Summit um, in Dubai. Um, each year, um, we run these briefings, a series of successive briefings, really to to just provide a mechanism whereby our students can um, look from the outside in at what's happening at these COP negotiations in relation to uh, the climate crisis that we're in, um, and then provide their briefings um, on the um, negotiations that are that are underway. Then in parallel, um, myself and other faculty from our university who are here um, in Dubai at COP28, we, we pull in some guests, invited guests, um, to give commentary themselves uh, on what they consider the progress is that is being made here at, at COP28. Um, and, and it's each year they, what we notice is that we get a wide diversity of, um, of um, perspectives. There, there's like 86,000 people at the, uh, at, the, at the conference here from many different sectors, walks of life, uh, age groups. Um, it really, I suppose, strikes home that the climate crisis is systemic in our societies and economies, and therefore there is nobody left untouched by it. And there's a lot of momentum and energy um, being um, employed here to try and find ways, you know, perhaps not as fast as as we would we would we would all would like. And I suppose that you know the it's clear that these negotiations are happening. Um, you know, they're driven by the part. We had the Paris Agreement in 2015. And, you know, if we look at the articles of the Paris Agreement, we've got the, the Article 2.1a, I think it is, which is um, about limiting uh, warming to 1.5 degrees and to do our utmost to stay within 1.5 degrees and also to limit warming to well below two degrees before the end of century. And then we have also the ambition to get to net zero. And the conference is really happening against the backdrop that none of those targets, um, we're not on track to meet any of those targets. We're probably headed towards like three degrees warming by end of century at current um, business as usual. Um, so one big aspect of the of the conference here at the moment is something called the global stock take, which the students will talk about. Um, and really that stock take um, is really taking taking stock, as its name indicates, of each country's um, plans. They're, they're largely plans and their pledges and their ambitions to collectively keep us within 1.5 degrees or keeping 1.5 degrees alive. Um, however, the there's a synthesis report that feeds into that, into the global stock take, which kind of in, which indicates that if all of the plans on the table at present were implemented uh, fully and uh, without any conditionalities, we would still be at 1.4% uh, increased emissions over 2019 of a baseline. So, so there's a real challenge um, in terms of um, in trying to stay, you know, trying to reduce emissions really rapidly. And there's a big debate, I suppose, amongst the negotiators and the different countries, some of which have more stake in the fossil fuel industry than others in terms of phase out or phase down of, of, of fossil fuels and, and the language is there's lots of different options. So the, the global stock take text came out in the past few hours, I think, and, and it's got it's basically a 27 page document um, with lots of paragraphs of different options for um, the negotiators to negotiate between themselves as to what would be the final outcome and whether there will be a document on this global stock take. That global stock take is about nationally determined contributions or plans, and it also speaks to a, a need for countries to ratchet up their ambition. The other piece that uh, I just flag up um, that's happening as well, I guess, and it's more in the sidelines in, in a sense in terms of the, the technical underpinnings of the cli climate crisis and the scientific basis. Um, there was a document came out, I think, in the last uh, in the last week or so, which is looking at at really tipping points in our terms of our earth system. And, you know, we're, we're well aware of the um, planetary boundaries concept, but that's not necessarily, you know, woven into the um, into the negotiation text of these of the Paris Agreement and the UNFCCC, and that that study has indicated that there are like twenty six tipping points um, of the across the Earth system, and about five of those are about to be passed. and And so there are a lot, there's a lot of worries about um, about tipping points and irreversible tipping points, which may be 
not possible to kind of get back from, yet they could be positive or negative. Then we've also been following quite closely the agriculture um, side of things. We've as um, we run the master's program in climate change, agriculture, and food security here at the University of Galway, and our students that that's pretty much the focus. Um, and so we're kind of delighted in some ways to see that there's a declaration on sustainable agriculture, climate resilient food, and climate action um, that has emerged. That 133 countries have signed. Um, Ireland I think is the 54th signatory. Um, however, one of the kind of the observations that some people have been making is that um, energy is is a systemic piece of the negotiations. It's cross cutting everything, but all the other areas that are probably just as systemic, including our food and our agricultural and food systems, which are systemic to our existence, are treated as sectors. And and there's as a result, they don't get woven across everything. And so. It'd be interesting to see whether in the, there there are three draft texts under um, under negotiation at the moment, um, and there, there's others as well. But kind of three key ones: the global stock take, there's the global goal on adaptation, which is being negotiated as well, and then there's the just transition text. And and again, they the outcomes of those whether they will you know explicitly mention agriculture, agri food systems is will be some measure of to what extent agriculture and food systems have been uh, considered at this copper or kick down to the road to the next one. Um, and I guess the just transitions text is really important also um, to provide um, essentially the kind of social license and the political room for maneuver for um, politicians and policymakers to be able to make the radical changes in our societies and economies to, to get to um, one point to get to a 1.5 degree or stay within 1.5 degrees and get to net zero as quickly as possible. So that, that's just, you know, some sort of overview from myself here. I think now I'm going to, I'm going to hand over to Emmett. Um, so we have, we have Emmett and we have Alex and Clestia, and these are our team and this group that our third group of students who are, um, who have been um, tasked with developing a briefing and they they also have a broader member of their team. So there's three representatives of their team and they'll explain who their team is. So I'm going to hand over to Emmett. And then after that, we'll, we'll come back to our invited um, guests to get their commentaries on what they think is happening at COP28. So over to you, Emmett. Um, thank you, Professor Splan. I'd like to start by expressing our appreciation to the Ryan Institute for this opportunity to present our briefing titled Victories, Challenges and Expectations into the Final Stretch, which explores these various aspects of COP28. Next slide, please. This briefing was put together by my following colleagues and I, uh, Alex Firestein, Ashnafi Taraku, Klesi Noknale, and Grace Muziamba, uh, and myself, obviously. Uh, next slide, please. We kick off by acknowledging that we have now passed the halfway point of COP28 after the day's break. Leading up to the break, we saw the coverage of various important topics, such as just transitions in energy and industry, indigenous peoples, and decarbonizing transport and urban environments. Over the following days, we expect to see the conference discuss further important issues in the areas of youth, children, education, and green skills, nature, land use, and oceans, and food, agriculture, and water. With these discussions being followed by two final days of negotiations, leading to the closure of COP28 on Tuesday, the 12th of December, with these, negotiation, with these negotiations potentially defining the conference. Next slide, please. We will now reflect on whether the climate actions taken in COP28 so far are enough. Have discussions led to measurable progress or have they been a means for posturing and empty promises? It appears as though decisions made so far are insufficient in combating the price crisis we face. We witnessed an early victory in the historic operationalization of the loss and damage fund, which was extremely contentious at COP27. However, we have since seen a slowdown in progress in major areas, such as the continued use and development of fossil fuels. Although the implementation of the loss and damage fund is a success and over 650 million has been pledged, we must also ask ourselves if it is enough. The independent high level expert group on climate finance, which have informed many of the reports from the UNFCCC leading up to this event, have indicated that up to 2.4 trillion would have been needed to address the needs of emerging markets and developing nations. It is also worth noting that the figure excludes China. COP28 still, however, has potential to deliver meaningful actions and progress with a specific route being provided by the global stock take. As Simon Steele, the UNFCCC's executive secretary refers to it, it is the vehicle to get climate action back on track. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
the best opportunity to act in the global stock take is at COP28 and is a key step in keeping the goals of the Paris Agreement alive. The global stock take is an important guideline and tool and can greatly aid decision making in closing the 22 gigaton CO2 equivalent emissions gap between current commitments and goals. Hence, it is important that we use the stock take to inform our next round of nationally determined contributions that will be declared in 2025 and current climate plans, which will still lead to a 9% increase in global emissions as projected by the IPCC. The stock take can allow for precise use of funding and measurable actions in areas such as finance, tech, and mitigation across all sectors, the shift of global energy systems and decarbonizing industry, and increase increases in the just and sustainable change of urban areas through real economy solutions as laid out in the 2030 breakthroughs. The global stock take is a crucial inflection point for the attendees of COP28 and the responses will be watched by the world. On that note, I will now pass over to my colleague, Alex. Thank you so much, Emmett. So I'm gonna talk about some of the key topics that have been covered throughout COP28 thus far leading to the halfway point. I'll begin with the finance sector. The multi-sectoral finance pledges have led the way. In total, over 83.38 billion US dollars have been pledged during COP28. And Germany is the country leading the way in terms of fund support, contributing just shy of 200 million US dollars spread across the loss and damage fund, adaptation fund, and least developed countries fund. In addition, pledges have come in from the private sector, as 15 major food and finance corporations pledged 2.2 billion US dollars to support an industry-wide transition to regenerative agriculture within their value chains. Also, much planning has been done. A financial roadmap to scale up capital flow into mangrove protection and restoration was endorsed by some of the world's largest financial institutions and provided a pathway to achieve the financial goals of the mangrove breakthrough, which was originally launched at COP27, aiming to secure the future of 15 million hectares of mangroves globally. Accountability was also instilled. The Climate Finance Forum was announced for 2024 to track progress against commitments announced at COP28 and to accelerate efforts to establish new finance framework for 2030. This will also ensure that institutions and governments follow through with their financial pledges that they have made here at COP28. There's been a great emphasis on indigenous people's direct access to finance, not finance, not only for equity, but also because indigenous people safeguard an estimated 80% of all biodiversity globally. Another fund, the Altera Climate Fund, was a $30 million fund launched by the UAE and emphasized the need to scale blended finance. It allocates 25 billion US dollars to climate strategies and 5 billion US dollars to incentivize investment flows into the global south, working with institutional investors like BlackRock. Finally, innovative investment clauses have been put forth climate resilient debt clauses and special drawing rights have emerged. The UK, France and multilateral development banks like the World Bank made new commitments to expand climate resilient debt clauses in their lending, which pause a country's debt when a natural disaster hits. This was the UK's first ever CRDC inclusion in a loan agreement and overall reinforces the theme of accounting for future loss and damage due to the impending effects of climate change. Next slide, please. In addition, there's a heavy focus on the energy sector and decarbonization. Greenhouse gas emissions overall must peak before 2025 at the latest and decline by 43% by 2050 to meet the 1.5 degree Celsius goal. Over 75% of these emissions are from fossil fuels. The Global Decarbonization Accelerator sets out a set of actions aimed at decarbonizing the existing energy system and building up an energy system of the future. Also, COP28 put forth the Global Renewable Energies and Efficiency Pledge, a pledge to triple renewable energy capacity and double the rate of energy efficiency, which was signed by 120 countries committing to improvements by 2030. Another major pledge is the Global Cooling Pledge to cut cooling-related emissions. 65 countries signed this pledge to cut cooling-related carbon dioxide emissions by at least 68% by 2050 compared to 2022 levels. Additional support for hydrogen and nuclear power development was emphasized throughout energy roundtables. The UAE put forth a hydrogen declaration of intent, 
with 39 countries endorsing a global hydrogen certification standard. Hydrogen is a versatile energy character that can be used to decarbonize hard to abate sectors. Based on an announced projects thus far, hydrogen supply could increase almost 40 times by 2030, particularly for use in the shipping and transport industry. However, in terms of outstanding debate, there was a call to lower fossil fuel subsidies, which topped out at seven trillion US dollars in 2023, according to the IMF, which is a historic record amount. This call has not yet been answered. There is also an ongoing debate amidst a record number of fossil fuel lobbyists to phase out or phase down. Phasing out means a total removal of fossil fuels like oil, gas, and coal, but a phase down indicates that countries can still use fossil fuels. This debate is yet to be settled and should be addressed in the coming days of COP. Next slide, please. Not only must we decarbonize energy, but we must also decarbonize our cities, our urban areas. Urban areas account for roughly 73% of global final energy use. There have been strides made in this conference in sustainable construction and definition. In sustainable construction, a coalition on greening construction leveraging sustainable wood as a substitute for emissions intensive building materials like cement, steel, and concrete was launched. The UAE and Canada also launched two new breakthrough pathways, net zero concrete and cement production, aligning future COP focus on these specific carbon intensive building materials. Also, a playbook for nature positive infrastructure development was brought forth on the global stage by the World Wildlife Fund and the Federation of Consulting Engineers, providing inspiration and guidance for infrastructure practitioners for use in urban development in all parts of the globe. Also, there's been a strong re redefinition of what our urban landscapes mean. The historic formation of the Coalition for High Ambition Multilevel Partnerships, the CHAMP, was endorsed by 63 countries. And this coalition strives to enhance the cooperation with subnational governments in planning, financing, implementation, and monitoring of climate strategies like the nationally determined contributions. In terms of NDCs, many countries still have significant progress outstanding. And this coalition enables more connectivity across levels of government, accelerating on the ground impact and implementation. The call to action for transformative urban planning catalyzed over 100 mayors in the C40 group to increase action towards 15-minute cities. 15-minute cities are an urban planning concept where residents can access essential services in 15 minutes or less by foot, bike, or public transportation. Also, a number of cities and regions put forth plans to become nature positive, whereby halting and reversing nature loss by 2030. Finally, the waste map is a global em methane emissions tracker, which was officially launched. This is the first ever global platform to leverage satellite monitoring to track and measure methane emissions from waste. The map is going live in 20 cities, which are home to over 100 million people. Not only does this signify significant strides towards methane monitoring and reduction, but also opens the door for further climate focus on remote sensing projects that leverage the increasingly available satellite data. I will now pass it on to my colleague, Clestia, to cover topics we should see covered in the second half of COP28. Thank you so much, Alex. I'm going to talk about expectations going forward in regards to youth and children engagement. COP28 presidency and the COP28 Youth Climate Champion team rolled out series of engagement events for youth during the United Nations Economic and Social Council, highlighting the essential role of youth in climate action with the team harnessing the power of youth climate action. It is highly the fact that children and young people are likely to face the worst effects of climate change. According to IPCC report, youth involvement is crucial to drive public policy on mitigation. Various examples of core benefits and value add of youth engagement we see in various processes under the convention, example, capacity building technology. Positive impacts of climate change policies and actions on youth includes increase in green jobs, just transition and development of green skills in the workforce, achieving the goal to transition to low low greenhouse gas economy, economic growth and di diversification. Negative in impacts 
as mentioned, putting the health and well-being, nutrition, education, development, survival, and future of children and youth at risk. And so what youths and children expect from COP28 includes better access to climate education and more funding to climate resilience infrastructure. Their voices to be heard by their respective governments and world leaders to increase funding to in to increase funding for sustainability youth led initiatives. Next slide, please. What is expected for the agri food, food sector? The COP the, the COP28 presidency, the United Arab Emirates has prioritized the link between food security and climate change for the first time since the annual climate COP began in 1995. While most of the talks have and will focus on increased renewable energy and financing the cost of climate change, the, this year's summit will also feature a dedicated food, agriculture and water day. As the, as the World Resource Institute's Edward, Edward Dave Partnership Director of the Food and Land Use Coalition put it last week. This is the COP where food and land fully comes of age. Recent studies shows that agri-food systems contribute about one third of all the greenhouse gases, gas emissions, and 70% of fresh water consumed worldwide is used for agriculture production. And so as and so it is expected that more than uh, 100 world leaders will sign the Emirates Declaration on Sustainable Agriculture, Resilient Food Systems and Climate Change, led by the COP28 presidency. Countries are committed, committing to expedite, expedite the integration of agriculture and food systems. A major agenda, a major action agenda and coalition on regenerative agriculture will be launched where it will bring together farmers, local governments, civil society, and other funders to, to transition large scale land spaces to more sustainable food, food production practices with the aim to showcase specific goals by, 20, by COP30. Advocates are calling for government, governments to recognize the vital role of food systems in addressing the climate crisis in the COP28. Next slide, please. In this theme, rec recognition is growing that nature protection and restoration are crucial to reaching net zero. The United Nations Biodiversity Conference, referred to as COP15, was held last year in Montreal. Governments came together to agree amongst other things on a new set of goals and targets that will guide, guide global action on nature through 2030. That's, the con, that's where the CONME Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework was adopted and aims to halt and reverse biodiversity loss by 2030 on par with 2015 Paris Climate Agreement. This historic framework, which supports the achievement of SDGs and builds on the convention previous strategic plan, plans set out an ambitious pathway to reach the global, global vision of a world living in harmony with nature by 2050. Expectations include understanding and addressing the implications of nature loss of, for sustainable pathways on conservation, restoration, and sustainable management of nature, um, empowering indigenous people and local communities and create resilient livelihoods. Let their voices be heard because they are the custodians of about 80% of the world's cultural and bio biological diversity and occupies 20% of the world's surface. And also to deliver a disclosure framework that helps organizations to access, access report and act on evolving nature risks and opportunities. An example of this will be the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosure. And also to standardize, standardizing corporate reporting, which would make it easy, easier for investors to as, assess nature risks. But data alone cannot guarantee, guarantee successful results. 
policy and so policy development is also needed. Parties to the convention are expected to produce national biodiversity, biodiversity strategies and action plans that will outline each country, country will with outline each country um, with GBF across key themes such as deforestation, plastic recycling and removal from the ocean, water scarcity, and redirecting farming subsidi subsidies towards projects that improve natural ecosystems and restore depleted soils. Next, next slide, please. That's the end of our presentation. Um, thank you for your attention and over to you, Professor Spillett. Thanks, thanks, Clestia, and thanks to to Alex and Emmett, and indeed all of all of your team for the for your wonderful um overview of you know where we are at with COP twenty eight and this kind of just past the mid mid halfway point. Yeah, so we have a few um commentators and um, some guests who have taken some time out from their from their busy schedules to to be with us today, and so I'm going to first pivot over to to Saiv O'Neill, and if Saiv, if you would introduce yourself, um, and then I'll then I'll move to to some of our other commentators as well. So I'm going to pass over to Saiv in terms of your reflections. So far on in relation to COP28. Thanks, Sof. Thanks very much for the invitation to join you. And thank you to the students there for a really interesting presentations. Um, the last few years I've attended um, most of the, the, the COPs since Paris and I am not there this time. So it's really interesting to hear your perspectives on how the negotiations are going on. So uh, in, in, I've come to the COP uh, wearing various hats, sometimes an academic one, but mostly my work is as a senior climate advisor for Friends of the Earth Ireland. And lately I've been focusing more on the national level implementation of our domestic climate law and the reporting cycle under the Act. So in recent times we've had um, um, attendance by various relevant ministers before the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Environment and Climate Action. And these hearings are specified in the legislation as an opportunity to review the Climate Action Plan as the next Climate Action Plan is being prepared. And the idea is to try to um, get a grip on what's missing what isn't working well, where the gaps to the targets are, and to quiz the ministers on what needs to be done to improve them. And I mentioned that um, because it's kind of a national level example of the global stock take. It's the process whereby you take um, stock of where you're at, how things are going, how the implementation of existing plans and policies and commitments have gone, and what needs to be done to build on that in order for the targets to be reached. So ideally, that's what we should be seeing with the global stock take. And it's a really important moment in the Paris Agreement sort of reporting and accountability cycle. Because as we know, the Paris Agreement doesn't mean that states are obliged to do things under international law to reduce emissions. The obligations in the Paris Agreement are largely procedural and reporting in terms of contributing uh, a national, uh, nationally determined contribution and participating in all the other activities. But the, the bindingness of a lot of the really important things in the Paris Agreement uh, vary, vary quite dramatically from clause to clause. And there's nothing in the agreement that requires each state to uh, to even have a net zero target, although that is what the science obviously um, requires. Um, so the politics of turning the kind of language that you get in these negotiations into concrete actions that you can take home with, clear guidance um, is, 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 is bizarrely Byzantine, you know, um, looking at the, the text that we've just seen that Charlie mentioned, um, that's come down lately uh, in the last few hours uh, that, that of the latest draft text for the global stock take. It's quite clear that it's a kind of kitchen sink full of different things. And there's a lot of wishful thinking. There's a lot of kind of flowery language. But what's interesting is when you see the draft text, you get a sense of where the positions are kind of lining up because it gives you option A, B, C or D and also the option sometimes of no text at all. And obviously there's some parties that would like lots of blank blanks and no text at all. 
so so when the final text uh, is agreed, you you forget that behind the scenes there was all these negotiations going on and wrangling over different options. So I thought it might be useful just to look at some of the, the key things in this, the stock take that are that are relevant. Well, firstly, a key thing that we always look for in the decision text, and I'm not sure, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what, what other people think, but um, sometimes there's huge fights, at even uh, all the way through to the very end, about how to recognize the latest IPCC scientific reports. Now, obviously we've had a COP since the, the last uh, assessment report came out. So in this global stock take draft, we're expecting to see some kind of language around um, welcoming uh, the, the sixth assessment report, and additionally noting with concern, with alarm and serious concern. But of course, that, that that sounds good, but it's not asking the parties to do anything. So not good. Um, we really need to see language that turns that concern <laughs> into concrete actions. Having said that, when you go along the text, um, we get into the meat of it. And of course, this COP is becoming extremely focused, and this is an extremely welcome, on the <clears> question <throat> of how to, to, to recognise the role of uh, phasing out fossil fuels. You'll remember that there's no mention of fossil fuels in the Paris Agreement. And the kind of big compromise to get agreement amongst all the different parties with their different energy systems as exporters and different levels of reliance on fossil fuel. The focus um, is to talk about emissions because theoretically something can happen between the combustion of the fossil fuel um, to stop the emission you know, arriving into the atmosphere. So this magical space where you can just make it all go away um, has been a kind of consensus space for a long time, but increasingly it's becoming very scientifically doubtful about whether or not the technologies can be scaled up in time to um, allow the continued combustion of fossil fuels at the scale that, that a lot of exporters and uh, petrol states would like. So there's a clash in terms of the science between what they would like and what's actually possible. So the language is clearly going to have to move. Um, so the question is, well, what, how will it move? It, there's an interesting reference in one of the draft articles to the idea of carbon space. Now, this has no meaning in international law or science, but it's interesting because we've never had a recognition, to the best of my knowledge before, that there is a global carbon budget. Now, atmospheric space, carbon space, you know, what does it mean? Um, but it, it implies something that might be spatially or temporarily limited or, you know, bounded in some way. <laughs> if nothing, uh, philosophically, if nothing else, that, that's probably progress. Um, now, there is a, a recognition in some of the draft text about what the science demands, but this is the sort of stuff that gets whittled away and eroded by uh, the negotiators who are determined not to have very strong scientific alarming messages into the into the draft text. So the, the language around peaking global emissions, something like that might, might emerge, but it'll be probably weaker than the strongest version. There's a reference to the IPCC recommendation for rapid and deep sustained reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. And, and an invitation to parties to peak their emissions. I don't think that's going to be agreed. The usual suspects will stop that. Well, we'll see. And there's a recognition that there is a gap between the nationally determined contributions, the combined aggregate impact of that isn't going to achieve the scientific recommendations for 2030 and for, for 2050. So all of that is what they're really going to fight over. And they'll fight over that till the very end. And what we'll end up with will probably be some sort of a mishmash that's better than the last COP. And that wouldn't be hard. And hopefully significantly better than COP uh, 26 in Glasgow, which was the first time we had a reference to phasing out unabated fossil fuels and, and uh, inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. So where we obviously expect to get progress and this is not new to you because you've been reading this all through the, the negotiations, is around the commitment to triple renewable energy capacity and double the scaling up of energy efficiency. Um, and it's, of course, that is not necessarily in conflict with the use of fossil fuels. So it's easy for parties to agree to that and possibly use it as a bargaining chip to kind of work away at the fossil fuel tax that they don't like. But even under there, 
there is interesting variations in the language. Like, you know, is there going to be a special calling out of coal or unabated coal? And that would be fantastic if there was a commitment of some sort, a recognition that unabated coal, bearing in mind the abatement technologies, don't really exist at scale to do what's needed to be done by 2030. So if there was a recognition that, you know, 75% reduction um, in unabated coal needs to take place by 2030, that would be an enormous achievement. But there are countries who are still building coal-fired power stations who will probably resist that. Um, there is an interesting move to include language around energy poverty and just transition when talking about the phasing out of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. It would be great if there was agreement on that because that really does help clarify what we need to do. A huge percentage of the fossil fuel subsidies that we have in Ireland are actually going into the uh, fuel allowance because technically the CSO regards that as a fossil fuel subsidy. And, you know, I don't think there's any desire to get rid of that at the moment. It's obvious that we, we need to support people who have higher energy costs and limited incomes. So the issue is not to take the money away, but to find ways of um, encouraging retrofitting in the rental sector and in social housing. And then finally, I was just going to mention um, a couple of the other pinch points. One, one interesting one is a recognition in the global stock take test of the methane pledge that was agreed in Glasgow. So if you recall, this was a, a voluntary commitment and uh, wasn't in the official text, but it was agreed by a bunch of states in Glasgow that methane emissions, mostly fugitive emissions from the oil and gas industry, would need to be reduced by 30 percent by, by 2030. This was very welcome. There hadn't really been any move on methane before this. And Ireland signed up to this. So interestingly, during the week, I got a uh, sight of an interview with the Taoiseach uh, Leo Varadkar, who, when he was asked about this particular pledge, because it's being introduced into the text now, um, whether or not Ireland would deliver a 30% reduction in methane emissions. And he said, well, uh, you know, we're just working on, you know, delivering the targets we've already got. Thanks very much. Uh, we don't need any new ones. And um, so you have this difficulty, and I mentioned it because it applies to everything else, of countries that will go to the COP and sign up to a global goal, like an aggregate reduction of something or other, but in practice don't see that they're either willing or able to do it at a national level. So what is important is that we take whatever is agreed, and hopefully something strong will be agreed around methane, and that we find a way of updating our national laws and policies to reflect that commitment. Because if that's if that's the best ambition that we can um, get out of the negotiations, that it's worth putting the fight into translating that into national action, because otherwise, what's the point? Um, nothing, nothing will happen. And the same is true around the finance commitments as well. So we, We've obviously finally got to the point in the last year or so where the 100 billion in climate finance annually has been arrived at. But at this point, we're really talking about trillions in terms of the adaptation requirements and loss and damage needs of developing countries and vulnerable countries. So there's a lot of different things in the text around climate finance. Very, very interesting language. And this is going to obviously be a new quantified global goal for adaptation. And this is really important because for developing countries, as, as you guys will know, there has been um, an awful lot of um, uh, uh, funding that has been directed towards mitigation rather than climate uh, adaptation, and also uh, funding that is in the form of loans rather than grants. So there's always going to be a debate with finance about the role of multilateral development banks and the role of private finance and um, I think the fact that we have agreement on the loss and damage fund allows the parties to kind of zero in on, well, OK, assuming we get that fund up and running, might not be perfect, might not be exactly the way we want it. But at least we can, we can park that issue slightly and look at what we want to do with this global goal and adaptation and clarify uh, what the parties want to say about private finance. But for many developing countries, that's deeply problematic because they don't see that it's consistent with the uh, Paris Agreement and its uh, principle of equity and the idea that historical responsibility has to play a part in estimating a country's fair share and contribution. 
so so Charlie, I've probably gone on a little, so I'll stop there. And if uh, there's anything, oh, there was one th other thing. I'm sorry, I wanted to mention, which is around the agriculture. So there's a number of events and things happening around agriculture over the next few days, and of course, this is where Ireland gets really stuck in. And I think that you have to remember that in addition to the fossil fuel lobbyists at COP, we also have a huge number of people present who are lobbying for the livestock sector and have successfully watered down the language in a lot of the texts already, you know, even before they get to the parties, including the Emirates Declaration, which isn't really worth much, in, in my opinion. When you're looking at a country like Ireland that really needs to address its livestock emissions and think about uh, its food systems approach, um, that declaration doesn't really involve any meaningful change. It's just nice waffly language. Um, so there's no commitment there to sustainable diets. There's no uh, commitment to promoting plant-based diets, to promoting food systems that are respectful of the science and um, addressing all the different, as Charlie said, systemic problems in the food and agriculture system, which include all the same things, inefficient subsidies and all kinds of other externalities and problems and difficulties. So I'm not very optimistic that we're going to get uh, anything serious um, that will bind Ireland in, in, in the direction that it needs to go in. And I'm also quite worried about the role of the Irish government in the negotiations. They have a very um, sort of, let's, we, let's say, less than transparent approach to these negotiations. They always like to present themselves as really constructive and positive, uh, which they do play that role in, in respect of many other areas. But when it comes to agriculture, they unfortunately uh, act in rather conservative manner to support business as usual and sometimes that involves trying to reinterpret the science in a way that um sort of makes the sector look a lot less harmful than it actually is so i'll just stop there thanks charlie so th thanks so much and thanks so much for for <laughs> like taking everybody through the um through the global stock take text and i think it's really it's really important that you've explained to people that looking at the draft text is a way of understanding the negotiation process itself. I think that's very valuable because yet that's not apparent to people what what is behind the politics of compromise, essentially, which is what the outcomes of all of these um these intergovernmental negotiations are. Yeah. So like I'm I'm going to move on because I realize I realize time. So so our, our next um guest is 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 Anna Hickey from Philip Lee and um and Anna I met Anna earlier today at, a, at we were we were all went to a briefing with Eamon Ryan the, the minister um for for environment in, in Ireland and um and Anna had gladly um agreed to join us and give us a why why is Anna there and why is Philip Lee there and uh, so if Anna I want to hand over to you and just say like what your kind of thoughts are on COP28 and the process itself and you know why it's important to yourself thanks so much just unmute myself um can everyone hear me yep loud and clear okay, brilliant I'm uh, I'm in a um a hotel lobby in uh, downtown uptown Dubai, um so just making sure that there is uh, no noise. Um, so I'm a solicitor um, based in Dublin with Philip Lee, and um, we do uh, a, a lot of work in climate finance, particularly carbon markets, both voluntary carbon markets and Article Six. Um, so that's that's what sort of made us interested in coming to COP. It's our first time. Um, Philip Lee, our chairman as well, does a lot of energy efficiency and renewables work, both of which are big topics at COP as well. Um, so I suppose what's what's really interested us is the climate finance um, side of things. And, and by that, I don't necessarily mean so much the loss and damage or, or, or grants, but the, the, the more market mechanisms. And I think there's been a huge need. It was announced by John Kerry and, and others this week that we really need to mobilize private sector finance and investment. We are not going to solve these problems with just um, uh, government money and grants or loans. Um, so, and there was a statistic actually mentioned at the DFA briefing that um, apparently only 20% uh, of, the, uh, of the world's GDP is, is, is comprised of governments. Um, the rest is 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 everything else, pension funds, banks, etc. So that's where we really need to be looking to. Um, there's a, I suppose, um, there's, a, there's a, the main thing going on at COP with regard to the markets is the negotiations around Article Six of the Paris Agreement. Um, and Article Six of the Paris Agreement allows countries to cooperate um, in terms of trading emissions reductions and and, and non-market mechanisms as well 
with the purpose of meeting their NDCs and increasing their ambition. Um, they're, they're, they're quite technical in terms of, of, of the actual negotiations, but um, I, 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 can, I can give you an overview of, of Article 6. Um, so Article 6.2 allows bilateral cooperation between countries. And this was solved in, in Glasgow in terms of the double counting problem because under Kyoto and the Clean Development Mechanism, there was a problem that only global north countries had targets, global south countries didn't. So you could uh, get credits for a, 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 a renewable energy project in China and count them towards your own emissions, but then China would, would be able to go off and do something else and not count it towards theirs. So um, the double counting is, is a big piece of, of, of Article 6 that was sort of unlocked in Glasgow. And since then, they've been trying to operationalize it. Um, so 6.2 is bilateral um, agreements between countries um, and Article 6.4 is, um, is, is, a, is a new sort of market mechanism effectively along the same lines as the clean development mechanism in Kyoto. Um, and there's been a lot of work done to, to, to try and put these into practice. Um, I, I won't go into too much of the detail, but um, it, it's again, as, as Sai was saying, it's um, it, it, these, these texts are extremely long and they've, they've sort of three or four different options um, as, to, as to, 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 to give one example. So an authorization to, tra to transfer carbon credits, can it be revoked or not? A lot of the countries are saying it, it, it shouldn't be because that will undermine market certainty. But then other countries are saying it should. So you'll have one, two, three, and then all the options remain sort of in brackets until they've, until they've agreed it. So um, uh, it's sort of, it's, it's very interesting to observe. Um, and in terms of whether uh, we'll get agreement this week or next week, it's confusing. They talk about the first week of COP finishing on Wednesday, uh, and the second week starting today. Um, but um, I think we think, I think much like so I was saying, we, we'll end up with some progress with a lot deferred to working groups throughout the year. So the Article 6.4 supervisory body produces very technical and detailed guidance on uh, carbon removals. Um, the definition of that is, 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 is a big topic and how reversals would be treated. So if, the, if you're using, for example, um, if there's an afforestation project uh, and you're looking to generate and uh, trade and count carbon credits from that forestation project, what happens if the trees burn down? So that is called a reversal. And there are ways you deal with that. For example, having certain credits set aside in a buffer pool um, so the, the nations are trying to agree on on, on, on issues around around that is, is one example. Um, so um, yeah, so I think that I think there will be a lot of progress, but I think a lot will have to be um, deferred to to working groups. Um, and then in terms of um, I suppose other other things we've been we've been looking at. I mean we've been we've been keeping an eye generally on what Ireland has been doing. Um, uh, I met today with Mary Donnelly from the um, the Climate Advisory Council, and her view was very much that uh, Ireland is um, punching above its weight at the talks this year. Um, I think because the UK has had um, uh, clearly a, a, a stance on rolling back on a lot of climate commitments, and, and so Ireland is sort of seeing itself as stepping into that void and showing a lot of leadership. And I think there's a lot of respect for Minister Ryan as well, which is which is which is great. We're very very lucky to have a minister. Um, with so much deep expertise uh, himself as an, and as an EU negotiator. Um, I don't know whether um, there's anything more I should, I, I don't, really, don't want to go into too much detail on the negotiations, but again, to Saib's point, I think one of the key points of the climate finance piece is that um, there are certain sectors that will take so long to abate um, that uh, carbon credits is a way to, I suppose, um, at least make some, some contribution um, to reducing overall emissions, even while it will take some time to, to decarbonize those sectors. So we, what we often say about carbon credits and carbon offsets is that they are the net in net zero, because it will take us otherwise such a long time and it's even critically difficult and it gets harder and harder because we started with the low hanging fruit. So when we get to 2040, It'll be even harder to decarbonize those sectors that are that are currently hard to decarbonize um so that's that's another reason and then um the other reason for for that we, we talk about driving climate finance is that 
a lot of these projects wouldn't happen if it wasn't for um, finance via Article 6 mechanisms, um, because the countries just wouldn't be able to raise the finance to do so. Um, and also it means that they are additional so that they're, they are creating and reducing um, emissions that wouldn't otherwise have been reduced. Um, so an example of a project we worked on recently is in Senegal, a waste management project. And it's the first Article 6 um, project in the world um, in cooperation with the Senegalese government. Um, they're, they're, they're Sonajet, it's their, it's their Department of Waste. And it's the uh, Anna and Aust um, Swiss project developer and an Australian fund. Um, and the aim of that is, uh, is to um, like a biocomposting facility, recycling as well. And it allows, um, it's got huge SDG benefits as well, benefits for health, because you're having women, um, for example, would go through these huge heaps of rubbish, picking out bits of plastic to recycle. But now this will all be done through that through that facility. So, um, and to the point on, in, and thank you for the, to the students for their presentation, but on Plestia's point about um, indigenous peoples, it was Plestia who said that, um, the other, the other objective of a lot of these projects is to um, give a revenue share um, to communities and benefits to communities, um, and that's increasingly a focus as well um, on ensuring a environmental integrity, b benefit to communities, and then c crucially transparency, um, so that uh, they, you know, there's there's market confidence, but also that we know that it's a just a just transition as well. Um, so th those are those are some of the kind of highlights really on on Article Six. I, I don't know if anyone has any other questions or if that's kind of that's enough for now. Th th Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Anna. That's really wonderful, and and it's it's really great that um that we've had have to get you here to you know to kind of show the I guess the detail of the considerations and you know in relation to just one of the articles of of the Paris Agreement you know and so and that that level of um I suppose detailed negotiation is happening across all of the articles of you know in parallel that that's the other point I suppose about the negotiations is that is that government delegations have to. You know, provide delegates that would that can cover all of the multiple parallel tracks of the negotiations. Like it's not just a negotiation of an overall text. There's like many, many parallel things happening, and 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 it's difficult for many like smaller um, governments, particularly um, less developed countries, to kind of to have the resources to sustain track of all of these negotiations. And and Ireland and other countries um, try to provide supports to to poorer nations essentially to to be up to speed essentially or be able to kind of you know engage meaningfully in these type of parallel negotiations so so i think that's important as well so thank, thanks thanks very much Anna, and, and thanks for your time and sorry and, and sorry for dragging you it's, i know it's evening time here yeah so we, we we've got two 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 more commentators here we've got we've got my, my colleague uh, dr peter mckeown who's the coordinator of the master's program on climate change agriculture and food security here at the university and then we'll finish up with, with una murray um who's also um un evaluator peter over to you yeah yeah, yeah thanks charlie and and just to thank all of the uh speakers and especially um, uh, the students, uh, as Charlie said, I'm the uh, coordinator of the master's program uh, we run in at the University of Galway in uh, climate change, agriculture and uh, food security and Electra in uh, plant and agribiosciences. I think it's very interesting, uh, some of the different elements which have been touched on and which each in isolation give, uh, give rise, I guess, to uh, a degree of hope that a lot of the topics uh, we want to be uh, seeing in the agriculture and uh, food security space uh, seem to be on the agenda much more uh, than they would have been with a big focus on uh, the regenerative regenerative agriculture, a big focus on um, the contribution of the blue economy to food security uh, and uh, the, the whole idea of a food systems uh, approach starting to, to really come onto the agenda, uh, but equally uh, as, as the students themselves have um, spoken about, uh, there's a lot of dots uh, to, to join up. Um, and uh, just today, uh, we, we saw the re uh, release of the um, uh, FAO's report on um, the state of um, uh, livestock, uh, pathways towards lower emissions. Um, uh, from livestock agri-food systems, which, uh, which as you'd imagine, makes quite a sobering uh, reading as it does sort of lay out the scale of some of the issues, including uh, in the, including an, a desperate need for uh, efficiency within 
uh, areas of the developing world where people really do uh, face uh, an, a need uh, for for better uh, food security from nutrient rich foods, but also the enormous enormous um, uh, footprint of the livestock industry, which is set to increase. And as Anna was saying, this is um, this is an industry which which is in some ways like the the fossil fuel industry, in that there's a lot of perverse incentives going uh, going on. Um, likewise, uh, the balance between um, protection of uh, biodiversity uh, and land use, and and also uh, I think it's important to note that a lot of the the energy transition uh, potentially has uh, a lot of implications for land use as well. So who who's going to be involved in uh, benefiting from land uh, land use and actually overseeing those decisions and this comes again to the uh, the focus on uh, indigenous uh, peoples there was um uh, quite a compelling uh um uh, quite a uh, compelling uh, letter uh, which was released from a group of uh, indigenous um peoples leaders and and their allies uh sort of uh, really calling for the need for um uh, free prior and informed consent when it comes to decisions over use of indigenous lands and in particular sort of highlighting uh, that indigenous peoples and I guess smallholder communities in general have suffered very badly from uh, extractive industries connected to the fossil fuel industry but equally a transition towards uh, renewable energy grids we know that there's a big drive for a lot of things like rare earth minerals which are located uh, on the lands of indigenous peoples, uh, and, and the letter sort of really, really calls that we can't be in a situation in which uh, indigenous people are are made um, uh, 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 victimized in a in a race for quick fixes for emissions that they are not uh, creating. Um, and uh, again, you can make the same point, I guess, around um, protection of uh, fisheries, mangroves, which we've already heard about as well. And so, all of these things have big, big questions around. Uh, or big questions around uh, who controls decisions uh, over land uh, is what what food is being produced, what areas are being conserved by diversity, uh, what areas are, are going to be needed for uh, potentially uh, ex extractive uh, industries, uh, and the other thing which um, I don't think we've heard much about at the moment is is the continued role of uh, of carbon of carbon uh, capture and carbon offsets. Uh, which continues to be um, uh, the crux, I guess, of this talk about phase phase out versus uh, phase down. A, a key question is going to be to what extent um, uh, we can tolerate continued fossil fuel uh, uh, emissions if there are offsets elsewhere or if we imagine that there is going to be a scale up of carbon capture technologies. And again, um, both uh, carbon capture technologies and offsets involving things like reforestation, they have a high land footprint, and the, uh, they are not necessarily these are not necessarily uh, uses of land which are um, uh, in agreement with maintaining either um, uh, biodiversity or with the food security and traditional practices of the, of the people who currently live on the land. Uh, so, are we going to see more top-down decisions driven by a failure to to decarbonize um, uh, the energy sector because of that? So, uh, a lot of interesting, interesting and important elements sort of coming to the fore, which is great. But I think there's still there's still a as ever a huge amount of devil in in the detail, particularly around some of the trade offs and and who who is empowered to actually decide on those trade offs. I just. Uh, maybe I finish uh, hand back over to Charlie and just finish by thanking um, this this group of the students and all all three groups of the students over the last uh, ten days for sort of highlighting uh, a lot of these complexities uh, as 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 we come towards the end of the COP. Thank thanks so much, Peter, and uh, and uh, and it's really great that you you've kind of raised a range of the like. There's so many touch points that relate to uh, the climate change connects to that. All are interrelated, and and every pathway involves winners and losers essentially. And and the real dilemma is like how to mitigate the effects on the losers, but also to ensure that the winners don't win too much. Essentially, that there's some equity in society. Um, so I'm going to add that I'm going to hand over to Una Murray and Dr. Una Murray, who's here at, at COP also, and just to Una's been following um, various um, 
uh, channels, let's say, of the COP28 negotiations. I'm gonna, that I'm going to hand over to you, and then if it comes back to me, then we'll, we'll wrap up. Okay, over to you now. Okay, um, I, I feel I'm at the end, so I'm not going to take too long. Just to let you know what I've been doing, um, I've been following some of the parallel processes, um, particularly the climate mobility uh, group. There's an advisory group, which I'm a member of, on climate mobility. Um, and I've been I'm going to be moderating a session on social protection, adaptive social protection, um, which is a means to help to minimize and address displacement and loss and damage. And I was at a very interesting talk today um, in the Azerbaijan pavilion where they have put in place um, measures, social protection measures are policies and programs that are meant to protect, protect people against poverty and vulnerability um, throughout their life cycle. And they... You know, it could be a child benefit, it could be a pension, it could be maternity or sickness or, you know, work injury. Some of them are contributory that you pay into and some are non-contributory. You get them if you're, you know, in, if you fit into these categories. So with the pavilion I was at in Azerbaijan today, um, they have a social protection program and they were able to, in response to shocks, they were able to ramp it up or add more people into it um, when there was mostly COVID shocks, but also for um, floods in Azerbaijan. And it was interesting to um, see that. The other one I've been following is the Just Transitions Pathway Work Program. And the, someone already, a few people already mentioned Just Transitions and they're meant to um, it comes from to help to achieve the Paris Agreement's goals equitably and, you know, to realise transformative change and leave no one behind. So I attended one of the negotiations as an observer on the Just Transition um, drafts um, on Wednesday, actually. And I didn't see if there was a, a document out this evening, but there should be. Um, but the discussions, a lot of the text was was sent back to the presidency and there was a huge task ahead of, of consolidating a big list of what should be included in that. It's kind of like a huge list and there was about five different options put forward, like, you know, one option to get rid of the list, some options to get rid of it and even more, or sorry, some options to add further things and even more complicated options to keep H, get rid of A, you know, in the list. Uh, but it's going to be quite challenging to come out with a successful or succinct package of decisions on just transitions pathway, but it probably should be guided by the International Labour Organization has a lot of guidance on just transitions and green jobs um, and ILO recommendation 203 is worth looking at in that regard. Um, I also attended as an observer the, the agreement on who to host the which agencies would host the Santiago network. Um, Secretariat and it's UNDRR and UNOPS and there was a lot of cheering that that had been agreed unanimously um, and then um, the other part um, had probably been mentioned already because I missed the start was about um, people are happy generally with the outcome of the loss and damage um, uh, the outcome from the, from the first day um, but they're wondering what's next and some people are worried about the composition of the board and the Secretariat of the Loss and Damage Fund at the World Bank um, and, you know, there's a lot of ideas put forward, but basically the World Bank has eight months before they are eight months, months to put in place mechanisms to operationalize this fund. And that would, it's not the World Bank, actually, it'll be the board and the secretariat. So a lot really depends on who's appointed to the board and the secretariat. But some of the things that you hear is that the fund should have a rapid response mechanism. They should be nationally owned and have a sub-national focus. Um, and there should be a community direct access window. And, you know, people are wondering how can you trigger how trigger access to the funds? Um, you know, it shouldn't be just a disaster, but it should be anticipatory triggers. Uh, and some of the talks I've, I've been at, they talk about, um, like when you do provide funds in advance of a climate event, it can help people ensure that they don't maladapt, is that the word? Um, or they're not trapped, that they can move in advance and they don't sell their ast assets. Um, yeah, so they're the main things that I've been looking at. Um, funding is going to be a big issue and that's going to be the next COP. It's probably mentioned already. And I know you've already talked in detail about the global stock take. Um, and a, few, a huge amount of my time here has been working with people who are working on displacement and internally displaced persons and how to ensure that um, that population who are generally voiceless are included in the text 
texts so that um, eventually funding or programs um, can they, they'll be they can be included in just transitions or they can be included in um, areas around green skills for for jobs or financing. Um, so most of my focus has been on international development, um, just transitions, um, social protection and um, loss and damage funding. That's it. Back to you, Charlie, because I know it's quite late yeah. and I don't want to stay on too long. Okay. Thanks. Th thanks very much, Una. So, so I'll I'll just wrap up with, with just one, one last reflection. Things that, that this is our um this is our third and final briefing um, in terms of COP twenty eight. Um, so so one one thing that strikes me that this is a policy making forum, and um, and so we'll find within all of the texts that there's still reference to like one point five degrees being attainable, but yet all the kind of science and the monitoring um that's being done suggests that that the window for staying within one point five degrees is diminishing very rapidly, and what what that means in 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 effect is that is that it becomes with every passing every passing month of every passing uh, year that it becomes even more difficult to stay within one point five five degrees like the the ask in terms of implementation gets higher, the costs gets higher and and really what's what we have is a policy making forum that is trying to broker consensus amongst many different countries with different um, uh, different drivers essentially and and the devil is will will be in the implementation and implementation. You know, th this forum will set targets and it'll set some timelines, 2050, 2030, 20, you know, and so forth. But at the same point, it doesn't deal with the implementation. The implementation it has to be then done by those on the ground. And it is very difficult to shift any system to another system, whether that's an energy system or an agriculture system. There's inertia effects and path dependencies and there's this capital and expertise um, built into these. And it's very difficult to shift economies overnight. It can be done, and we, we could sort it with the COVID-19 um, pandemic, but whether their political willingness and the social license is there for it to happen at the speed that it needs to happen to say within 1.5 degrees is debatable. And I think therein lies a problem because the policymakers set policy, but somebody has to implement this and the implementation, the scaling of um, what is necessary on the renewable energy side, the transition away from fossil fuels or shifting diets and so forth, um, the scale at which that has to happen um, and the speed at which would it needs to happen is really on other parts of the picture that isn't necessarily, you know, it's there in the, in the negotiations, but it's not... Um, that has that comes after you, and so so then there's also that we have to um, consider, particularly you know the people here today, and and at, at this meeting and around the world, it's it's basically their children's grandchildren that will uh, look back and see and see these cop this whole cop process and say well you know here was was here a, um, a group of policymakers that should have acted faster, quicker, and to, to in relation to the situation we live in, in by 2100 or so. So at that, I think um, I think we'll wrap up our. Um, our um our briefings we've done three briefings and um, we've had three excellent group of students that have um, done like a sterling job of following what are really quite complicated negotiations and it's it's really a very good way i think um to for the students to, to get engaged in in the in the cop 28 the UNFCCC process paris agreement and so forth and and also like to, to thank all of our commentators tonight um Zive and anna and anuna and peter and and also over the past um over the past um three briefings but I, I'd also really like to to talk, to thank some people in the background here that have that haven't had, don't haven't had their voice in this and this uh, Isabel McLaughlin who's our communications officer and also Kira Varley and who's also uh, been helping Kira or helping Isabel with the um with the um the communications because setting this up has been technically um, challenging for us at times but we we do our best so at that I'd like to thank us all and thank yourselves and thank our audience and uh, we do hope you found these um these briefings to be useful and we will know by next Tuesday what the outcome of COP28 is and whether it will be seen as success or you know, somewhere in between, between success and failure. It's probably somewhere in the middle. It's the politics of compromise after all. There'll be lots of constructive ambiguity in there, I would say as well. Okay, so at that, I'll say good night and good day and thank you all.